The question is that the bill be now read a second time, and I call the member for Forrest. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Um, the opposition, as you are aware, is, is uh, supportive of this particular bill, uh, especially given that it delivers measures announced by the coalition in the 2021-22 MIFO budget up update. The measures extend the fee help loan fee exemption for students um, and enable eligible students studying micro credentials to defer their tuition fees to fee help. Other measures in the bill include strengthening the unique student identifier requirements, aligning Commonwealth assistance eligibility requirements for New Zealand citizens and minor and technical amendments. The bill will also make minor and technical amendments to section 26A of the TEXA Act, which deal with the, with the compliance with the tuition protection requirements as a condition of registration. Um, there are a range of, um, in helping with the vet fee help loan exemption, um, this extension that is within the bill extends that loan fee from 1 January 2022 to 31 December 2022 ensuring and encouraging students who have access to fee help who've been financially impacted by the effects of COVID-19 pandemic to commence and continue or continue their study in 2022. Expected to assist approximately 30,000 undergraduate students. Um, really important measure, Deputy Speaker. And uh, the fee help eligibility for micro-credentials also allowing students to undertake micro-credentials delivered as part of the Australian government's micro-credentials pilot to be eligible for fee help. Um, the New Zealand citizen uh, requirement, there's been changes in there too, um, as the um, uh, previous speaker uh, discussed. The requirements for students to provide their unique student identify, uh, the identifier to be eligible for help assistance and to study as a Commonwealth supported um, student. There are minor and technical amendments to um, HESA and amendments to the TEXA Act also contained in this bill. There's the removal of the 10% HEX help discount for upfront payments of student contribution amounts. And I would note at this point, Deputy Speaker, that the current HEX debt in Australia sits at $52.7 billion. And the last budget of the coalition government committed almost 20 billion towards higher education as part of our record 115.1 billion in total government funding for universities between 2019 and 2024. There was 95.2 billion in teaching and learning and 19.8 billion in research. In the 2021 budget, we funded an additional 30,000 places as part of 100,000 more places over the decade. We've got a very strong commitment to rural and regional education and uh, saw this very directly in so many ways, whether it was the regional university centres, and I make no apology, Deputy Speaker, for focusing on rural and regional, given that that is uh, the people that I represent and I look back to some of the issues that we had to deal with during our time. And I remember when, uh, when Labor was in government and the then Minister for Education excluded inner regional students from access to youth allowance, which had a massive impact in my region and uh, right around um, more of the inner regional areas around Australia. This was a really serious issue for young students who could not get access to and couldn't afford to go to university and follow their dreams. And it was something that we fought very hard um, on. And uh, we also committed to regional education through the regional university centres to help students in regional areas access higher education in situ, where they were, where they were essentially living or could get to, which is another really important issue in Western Australia. We had three of these, the Great Southern University Centre, the Geraldton University Centre and the Pilbara University Centre uh, as well. And I got to open officially the one in Albany and saw firsthand just how important this is to those young people in the region who were looking to improve their skills and improve their, 
their opportunities in life, not just in education. And we increased this funding um, over time and also included funding for uh, additional Commonwealth supported places for students being supported by the centres and that was a really important part of what we were delivering into the regional and more remote parts of Australia. And uh, um, they are doing just a fabulous job, uh, Deputy Speaker, and talking to the students there, uh, listening to their stories and the opportunities they had that they never thought they would have, especially to be able to stay in Albany and be able to follow um, their educational opportunities. Very, very important. given. Um, the disparity between the opportunities uh, for higher education that young people face in rural uh, and regional areas. The rural clinical schools also a very important part of trying to not only have, um, have uh, young people from our region have the opportunity for a, uh, an opportunity in um, becoming a GP or something similar. But to bring these people from Perth even, or from a city area, to spend time in a regional community as part of their study, and hopefully more of them would come back and, and live and work. We have a shortage of rural doctors, and this was part of our approach to get more um, clinical representation in the regions. And uh, that, that is, uh, I've met so many of those students. Equally, the tertiary access payment that we introduced um, from January 1st. This, uh, these were made available for students who live in rural and regional Australia, just to help them with the costs of moving to study. They were payments of three to five thousand dollars, depending on where the family home was situated. Um, in a regional areas was three thousand, out of regional places like Scott River, Warner Glen in my part of the world. Um, that was really important. It's the small things that matter, and when you get two parents with kids that want to go to higher education, working their hearts out so their kids can get the opportunity. I can remember back to that fight over youth allowance where I met a mum in a supermarket who said to me, I have to decide which one of my children can go, and I have five. And that, if there was ever a, um, some wind beneath my wings to fight hard for rural and regional, that certainly um, was it. And so, TAP payments also help to overcome the financial barriers that young students from regional and more remote areas face. There is an additional cost to having to live away from home, and it can be anything from, we've done several inquiries into this space, anything from $20,000 up, over and above, plus these young people have to live away from their families and the people who support them while they're doing that. Um, and the research and evidence shows that if you live in a rural or regional area, you're 50% less likely to have a university degree by the age of 35 than people who live in the city because they have direct access. And, uh, and this really is an important uh, opportunity that we keep giving young people who live um, in the regional areas. I also worked hard to get a, a University Department of Rural Health into ECU, Edith Cowan University in Bunbury in my electorate. Um, this was something we are so short of allied health workers, not only the GPs that I referred to through the rural clinical school, but also through uh, allied health workers that we need. So um, I was, I must admit, fought hard for this one because this is so important in our region. We have a very fast growing region but also one that is very, very attractive to people who are retiring and choosing our part of the world uh, to spend their years in retirement. But that increases the demand for not only for GPs and specialists, but also for allied health workers. So we um, really need to make sure we're training more of those people in situ so they stay with us. And they, you know, so many of the, the people I meet love what they do. They love looking after our more senior citizens or even just being in the health system. And uh, to have them able to have this training at ECU in Bunbury is fantastic for the southwest. And uh, I, I was so pleased to be able to get this over the line. Um, and Edith Cowan will prove to be a very sound partner in this program. And uh, they will be the 22nd university to provide increased rural and regional and remote training across Australia under this program. 
And when you see the shortages out in regional and remote areas, you know how important this program is. So it actually helps uh, support universities to deliver teaching and training to an equivalent or higher. And that's what I think ECU will do. They will deliver that higher standard um, that I'm sure they're aiming for than that that's achieved in metro settings. And uh, most importantly, we know that health professionals who graduate from rural placements are more likely to stay in the regions. And uh, we really do need them to stay with us. We need to stay, have them stay committed to what they've trained to do, which is provide such essential health and care for citizens of all ages, but particularly, um, as I said, we are seeing more and more people of a mature age choosing to retire and spend the later years of their life in the southwest of WA, and we are seriously short of GPs, and unfortunately the changes that was, were made by Labor straight after the election to the allocation of um, overseas trained doctors has seen those same doctors become targets uh, of outer metro areas to attracting them back into those areas. The, it's become far more competitive for us to be able to retain our GPs, and it's an ongoing issue for us to keep fighting for. Um, and, but I'm really hoping that ECU also is able to help with the broader medical profession and through the rural clinical schools and other measures that we're able to see more GPs from our region actually study, go away, but come back when it suits them with their families to live and work in what is a fabulous part of the Australia, which is rural and regional. Thank you, Deputy Speaker.